I'd like to reconvene the meeting of the Board of Public Utilities for the City of Santa Rosa. We've had two very informative uh, study sessions upstairs. We're now at item number four, minutes approval. We have two minute uh, meetings, October 18th, uh, at, at which uh, Board Member Carney was absent and I don't seem to have the minutes for the November 1st, so if somebody has that, there it is, okay. And at that one, all, all were present, so it'll take two separate motions, and Board Member Kearney, uh, you would abstain from the October 18th discussion. I'll move approval of minutes for the meeting of October 18th. Second. Motion made by Vice Chair Gale and seconded by Board Member Lowry for October 8th. 18th. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. With an abstention from Board Member Kearney. Now that next item would be November 1st. Minutes. Make a motion to approve the minutes for the meeting of November 1st. Yes. Second. Motion made by Board Member Galvin and seconded by Vice Chair uh, Gale. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. I have a bittersweet task before me at this point, uh, something about a proclamation. <laughs> and 
after 27 years as utility director for the city of Santa Rosa, Miles will be uh, retiring on a very significant date. I think we all know what it is, but it happens to be 12, 12, 12. And as I look at this resolution, um, it seems to be somewhat short in that there are only nine whereases. So that's not even one whereas per year of duty. But I think it's important enough uh, that I'm going to read this uh, entire resolution. It's a resolution of the Board of Public Utilities thanking Miles Ferris for his contributions to the city of Santa Rosa and the utilities department. Whereas on November 1st of 1985, Miles Ferris was officially hired by the city of Santa Rosa as the first director of the newly formed utilities department and whereas Miles came on board at a time when the state of the nation was a department under a cease and desist order in place from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board and whereas Miles took over and developed a high quality department that is highly respected throughout the utility arena and whereas Miles has supported the organization to be on the cutting edge of the industry by being the first city in Northern California to, to have advanced tertiary treated wastewater and installing the first system in the United States to disinfect 100% of its wastewater and ultralight, ultraviolet light. And whereas in 1992, Miles was given the Recycling and Innovation Idea of the Year Award for his innovative approach to recycling reclaimed wastewater by drinking it. <laughs> and whereas Miles has been a proactive director evolving with the changing times by continually reorganizing to maintain the most efficient and effective department. And whereas Miles has created a supportive working environment for all utilities employees and has shown his appreciation by providing positive recognition for the outstanding work performed, including visiting employees during weekends, evenings, and holidays when they are needed to provide continued services. And whereas Miles has led and been key in all utilities employees providing outstanding customer service to the citizens of Santa Rosa, and where Miles has led the department in obtaining its many awards and recognitions, including 1990 Plant of the Year, 2002 three Theodore Roosevelt Environmental Award, 2004 Commitment to the Environmental Leadership Award, Geysers Project, 2004 Water Reuse Project of the Year Award, again the Geysers Project, 2005 Claire A. Hill Award for Excellence, the Geysers Project, 2008 National Second Place Clean Water Act Recognition Award for Pre-Treatment Program Excellence, 2000 Interstate Renewable Energy Council Renewable Energy Innovation Award for Aquatic Biomass to Fuel, 2008 Water Reuse Institute of the Year for the Subregional Reuse System, 2009 AMWA Platinum Award for Utility Excellence, 2009 Aqua Theodore Roosevelt Environmental Award for Excellence in National Resources Management, and 2011 Sustainable Infrastructure and Partnership Special Award. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Public Utilities and the citizens of Santa Rosa wish to thank Miles A. Ferris for his 20 years, seven years of service, be it further resolved that the city will miss his excellent management and engineering skills, dedication, and his humorous stories. Be it further resolved that Miles is off to hit the dusty trails and there will be no more burrs under the saddle anymore. <laughs> Duly and regulated, adopted by the City of Santa Rosa Board of Public Utilities this 28th day of November 2012. And I will say that it gives me great pleasure to sign this resolution on behalf of the board. The one thing that is missing here is I think I can sp speak for this entire board. We're not only losing the director of our utility department, um, we're losing a friend here at the dais that I've enjoyed working with for my tenure on the board. Thank you, Miles.
Thank you for that kindness. Come on down, Mary, and we'll get the whole board yes. in here tight. I now open it up to any of the other board members who would like to make a comment. I'll start here to my far left with Dan, if you have any comments, and we'll go around the board. Boy, um, Mr. Miles, as some <laughs> would call you. No, I just have to say that um, when I first came on this board as a newbie, I was um, really a fish out of water. And uh, Miles, you in particular, I think took me under your wing and, and helped me to um, begin to grasp all the technicalities and intricacies of this department and how it operates. And, and I just want to thank you for um, not just your years of service to the city, but to the individual members of this board over the years that uh, relied upon you for advice and guidance and your expertise. And, and um, it's going to be an interesting transition period and, and one that sympathize right now with whoever your successor happens to be because he or she's going to have some awfully big shoes to fill. Good luck to you in your retirement. Well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Board Member Swim? I, I just wanted to say also thank you so much. Um, your calm, positive, can-do approach sets a tone for this board that helps it so we can all operate in a, in a productive way. And it really comes from those values that you set for yourself and your department, and it, it spills over to all of us. It's been just a joy to work with you. So thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Gale. I also want to say thank you. When I first came on the uh, board, I had a similar experience to Dan's. Um, I think that uh, no one understands actually the complexity of something like the utility department and you make it, uh, you have made it, I think for many people, understandable, and your patience with us has helped us to make great progress in understanding the utilities area. One of the things I've come to uh, appreciate in my short tenure on the board is that not only do you foster innovation within your department, uh, but you also bring a wisdom that has helped us, I think, to avoid problems and to not move too quickly when what was actually best was to have a considered approach to issues that uh, where that was extremely appropriate. And I think that wisdom that you brought is something that uh, anyone who comes next will have a hard time bringing that to the board. And personally, I'm going to miss it. And I just want to thank you very, very much for all the assistance and for your leadership. Board Member Lowry. Miles, I want to say I appreciate what you've been able to provide me. I've only been on the board for a few years, but uh, your ability to have me participate in various tours within the facility to find out more about how the operation works, uh, meeting various staff members within the organization. And although I'm primarily a tax and, and accounting instructor, 
I also in, uh, taught uh, many theory at Sonoma State University. And I want to say that you followed the principles that we, we provided in the classroom, which we rarely see on the outside. And you did, have done a marvelous job where you've got a staff that's working well, uh, it's calm, there's no crises, generally speaking, that are causing all kinds of bad decisions. Uh, you take your time and checking things out and patience and you will out. You've done a great job and I do appreciate what you provided for me and I appreciate what you provided for the utility department and the city of Santa Rosa. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Carney. Thank you. I've come to appreciate the utility department as a world-class organization. And that only happens for one reason and that's its leader and my compliments to you on what you have um, what you have created here and will be appreciated for a long, long time to come. And congratulations. Thanks. I hope you enjoy your retirement. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> and since uh, the two ladies at my far right have sat up here at the dais with us for so long, I'm going to ask uh, Assistant City Attorney Suzanne Rawlings to make any comments she wishes and then Board Secretary uh, Gina Perez. Thank you, Chairman Dowd. It has truly been my pleasure to work with Miles, oh, very closely the last 14 years and actually a little bit back in the 80s when, when Miles was the director of a newly established department, which he basically built from scratch into the world-class department it is today. Um, I'm very proud to say that I work with the city of Santa Rosa when I go to the statewide organizations, Aqua and CASA. Um, we are always well ahead of the curve, um, always in good shape on compliance. It makes my job as an attorney easy, and I've been extremely proud to work with Miles and his department for the last decade or more. And Miles, I wish you all the best in your retirement. Thank you. Mrs. Perez. Miles, it's been my pleasure to, to work for the Utilities Department. Um, I am coming on 11 years with the department now, working in various um, areas. And in my experience, you have treated everyone within the organization the same, no matter what level they happen to be. Um, the fact that anybody can go and talk to you at any time is appreciated much within the organization. And I have enjoyed being Thank you. I believe uh, there's a lot of other staff here that certainly can feel free to wave and, and speak if they choose, but I know that uh, Del Tredenic does have some comments that he wanted to make. <laughs> can you put the time limit uh, yeah. on? <laughs> Get the claw ready. Can we have the three minutes, please? All right. Chairman Dowd and uh, members of the board, including board member Galvin. <laughs> Is this working? I want to make sure you hear me. <clears throat> Try that one. Okay. Um, okay, can you hear me okay? All right, thank you. Actually, the reason I'm up here is because of uh, Deputy Director Powell. He reminded me of something that Miles really stimulated several years ago. And um, uh, Mark has the ability to remember things that happened in this organization as well as Miles remembers every single second of his police work and has, re <laughs> has recounted to us. So. Um, I guess uh, after sitting through the study session and listening, um, this really is and this really was kind of a, an interesting uh, process that we talked about because of Miles' ability to solve problems, his desire and his motivation to innovate his desire to make money and to stay solvent, and particularly for creative reuse. And so what I'm going to be talking about today, briefly, is the former logo for the city of Santa Rosa. And I, can you, can you, uh, do you guys have screens or? They're, they're not connected to our uh, document camera, so we need to. Okay. Well, you're going to have to turn around and look at this. This is, you know, this is kind of 
you know, blowing my presentation here, sorry. Um, so this was the original uh, City of Santa Rosa, it was the check mark. And there was a movement afoot back in 1993 to change the logo. And while Miles wasn't necessarily opposed to changing the logo, he was struck as a, as a practical engineer with the legacy of this on cars, on letterhead, on business cards, on, and so this really bugged him. And he came to me to help, probably because I walked past his office <laughs> at the time when he was hit with this, and he, just, and he needed a solution to it, so he set me on the task of helping, how do we solve this problem with the logo change? How do we transition? So the first thing um, that we did, or we looked at, was uh, really going to uh, make some money. And so we, we came up with, with this. <laughs> and and uh, we approached um, Phil Knight, the CEO, and, and basically the primary stockholder of Nike. And we thought this would be a subtle way. We could applique it over the check mark, and we could use it on police cars and everything else. But unfortunately, Phil Knight insisted on point, well, instead of a city designed for living, he, he wanted to have just do it up there. And that did not go well with Ken Blackman. So we, we, did, we opted for that. So in, in, in hoping to curry favor with Ken Blackman, who was a runner, and I know that board member Swint is, and Linda is, and some of you, of you may appreciate this one. We came up with this one for the city manager's office, which is, as you may be able to see, is not, not a Nike, but it's a leg. Basically the check mark, we could overlay it, and that maybe didn't go over too well, except, as you can see, it was a city designed for running, and I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the city of Prunedale adopted this as their logo. So I don't know, but okay. <laughs> Uh, then he was trying to curry favor with the transportation department, so he opted for this amendment, which was Highway 12, which is still unresolved today. <laughs> and because he loves law enforcement or uh, public safety, we, he liked this one for the fire department. <laughs> and then finally, for us, and this is, again, I'm gonna highlight the date here. We're talking 1994. This was the logo that he approved for, this, for the department, the utilities department, which presaged the pipeline to the geysers. And then I started to look at this and said, well, where does it actually go? You know, where does this go? So I took, I sort of found a map in the, in the, uh, in the, I mean, you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a map from the United States that sort of roughly fits this. And you can see that we're dumping our water, according to Miles, here between Colorado and Wyoming. <laughs> well, we fell a little bit short of Colorado and Wyoming, but we did do that, we did make it to the geysers. So that's where, that's where Los Angeles gets its water? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But in any case, this was, a, this, was our res this was his solution to a problem while we had the interim thing. Now, of course, as most of you know, and this is uh, and in the files, when I went back to the files and looked for this, I found this, which shows that on the fall of 1996, the, uh, uh, the, this logo was adopted finally. So it does put it in the context, and you can see this as a police chief was put on board. This was maybe two or three police chiefs ago, Miles. Yeah. So anyway, so this is sort of our way or my way of, of highlighting all of the accolades that were um, put on Miles. This is an evidence you probably would have never known about until, unless Mark Powell and Miles would have stimulated this. So thank you for... Chairman Dowd and the board for the opportunity to present this little thing. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> to, to wrap up the comments, if you go back to the written resolution that I uh, read to all of you, I think the thing is 
most impresses me about Miles' tenure here in the city of Santa Rosa is about the first or second whereas to the last one with all the awards. When Miles came here, this department was in dire straits uh, under a cease and desist order. Um, very, very difficult to operate under those conditions. Miles came in, started to turn the ship, and it was even then a big ship. It's grown immensely since then as our community has grown. But I think as you listen to those whereas is the awards that uh, this department has received has certainly been done with Miles guidance and leadership and his style but it also is contributable to all of the hard-working uh, good employees that he's had the blessing to work for him as well so as a whole good job Miles and thank you thank you We have, we have two consent items, uh, which I think are self-explanatory, unless someone wishes to pull them off. Uh, Jennifer Burke, as vice chair of uh, Aqua, is 6.1, and 6.2 is an extension of a contract for polymer supply, and it's for an additional one-year term. Uh, with no unit price increase and the actual amount is uh, additional is less than what we had budgeted in the previous year. I'll entertain motions on the consent calendar. I'll so move to approve both consent items. Second. Motion made by board member Lowry for the two consent items and seconded by Vice Chair Gale. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, the first report item uh, is uh, 7.1, which is a reimbursement agreement with the Sonoma Marin Area Rapid Transit District for the design and construction of water and sewer main improvements at various street railroad crossings. Uh, city project identification number, 1747 and authorizing the utilities director to amend and to increase the not to exceed amount to eight hundred thousand uh, dollars deputy director glenn wright will make the uh, staff presentation and uh, if there's any questions of course as you look into the agreement that we don't cover we're here to answer Okay, well, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Dowd, uh, members of the board. Actually, I'm a little disappointed. I didn't, I, I was so happy that finally I didn't have to depend on a PowerPoint to have presentations, and now it's at your back. It's perfect for me, but it's difficult for you to see. Uh, but anyway, as uh, Director Ferris pointed out, uh, this is a uh, presentation on the reimbursement agreement with SMART uh, to put in uh, essentially casings at six rail crossings in Santa Rosa. So if you recall, uh, we brought together almost an emergency item, we thought, on August 16th uh, for this agreement, and apparently it couldn't have been that much of an emergency because uh, none of our uh, facilities have been covered up by tracks yet, uh, and it is now, I believe, almost December. So um, I, I don't know the full reason what the holdup was. I understand the rails got delayed somewhere in the Midwest and didn't come out here and something like that. But um, we do, uh, the, the uh, SMART did actually install a casing on um, Sebastopol Road. They put a 60-inch casing in. Um, <clears throat> so some work has happened. So there's actually two items uh, in front of you today. There's one, in, which is the uh, agreement that we discussed back on August 16th, uh, which was for uh, $269,000 to reimburse a SMART for the uh, project on uh, Sebastopol Road and also on 8th Street. Uh, since then, uh, changes uh, have occurred uh, in the design build arena. 
uh, and we have the opportunity to uh, increase that contract. So uh, there's a, the second item of this uh, presentation is an amendment. Uh, should the board uh, uh, consider uh, increasing uh, the uh, amount of the agreement. The way the, uh, the amendment is structured is that you authorize the uh, director of utilities to uh, execute amendments up to a maximum of $800,000 uh, to, to do the agreements. Um, there's no magic about that number, $800,000. Uh, the board certainly has options to uh, not uh, have that amendment as it's stated in the, in, the, in the packet. We could bring it back to you again. Uh, we could make the amendment for less. So th there's no magic concept of $800,000 or having the, the uh, director of utilities sign it. That was just something, that's just the way we, we presented it in the packet. So essentially, there are uh, six crossings that we're working on right now. First one is Sebastopol Road that is done. That one we put a casing in. Uh, at Third Street, um, there's a 12-inch uh, cast iron water pipe with no casing. Um, so we want to put a casing in there. And um, so on these projects, we're having the railroad put in the casings, and what we're doing is blind finding or valving off the water pipe. The railroad would put the casing in, and then our crews or a city contractor would then put the water main in. Uh, that is true for water. On the wastewater side, we can't really not have the wastewater flow for several days. So in those cases, we're actually having the uh, railroad uh, install the wastewater. So on uh, 7th Street, uh, there's a six inch vitrified clay pipe with no casing. Uh, we wanna put a casing in there. And in that circumstance, we would have the railroad actually install the casing and uh, reinstate the sewer on the very same day. On 8th Street, uh, there's actually a six inch um, cast iron water pipe uh, which uh, is in conflict with their actual crossing. So they need to move it to, to put their facilities in, and it also doesn't have a casing. Uh, and there's also an eight inch uh, VCP, um, uh, excuse me, it's, it's a, uh, eight inch VCP sewer main at that location, which again, we would put a casing in and uh, reinstate the sewer. West Robles, um, there's no crossing at all there, but we have, in our master plans, we have plans to put a 12-inch uh, uh, water main at that location. Obviously, it's way cheaper to put the, the casing in now. And lastly, at uh, Jennings, uh, we didn't even, this wasn't even on our radar. Uh, actually, Jennings, uh, there's a 12-inch water main there, which is cased. Um, and uh, we found out just uh, probably six weeks ago that at that location, the railroad is gonna double track it. So uh, what happened was, the, it's, a, it's a quite a complicated site. Um, the water agency's aqueduct actually is inside the railroad right of way, just within feet, just the one side of the pipe is on the edge. Uh, and we have, a, there's a turnout right there. And in our wisdom, uh, we put a uh, pressure reducing valve in the railroad right of way, which is gonna be right on the toe of the ballast of the um, tracks. Uh, so the, the problem is there, we have to get our pressure reducing valve out of the um, railroad right of way. The agency has to relocate their turnout, which is in the right of way. And also, as Faye would have it, the, we, did, we, we cased it, but we only put the casing far enough to go underneath the single track. So there's actually, when you have double track, we have, now we have to extend the casing. Uh, we're actually kind of doing a design in this right now. I don't know what we'll have to do. We'd like to extend the casing. That seems like the simplest thing to do, but uh, it's at the same grade as the aqueduct. So that means we have to go up or under or recase it. That's still under design and don't know exactly how that's gonna go. And that's kind of part of the reason why we're going with this $800,000 number and we don't really, if you ask me for a, a blow, 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 how exactly it's gonna be spent, we don't know because we're still trying to design around the railroad's um, program. It's one problem we've found with the railroad is uh, the design build is a pretty cool deal, but in the railroad, when they're within their right of way, the PUC regulates them, so they design it, and then they show us the plans, and then they build it. So there's, in a normal project, people would design it, it would get reviewed, and we would get to comment, uh, but not with the design build uh, railroad system it's inside the PUC, the PUC or controls. So, um, 
So the way that this contract is structured uh, is that it's on a force account basis. Uh, and uh, force account means it's basically time and material. Uh, and the way we're, it's written right into the agreement that uh, the city will monitor the force account work and will actually, at the end of the day, the way force account typically works is the contractor will do his work, the city will inventory materials used, equipment used, men used, they have standard uh, Caltrans rates and it's calculated that way. So the city will be totally responsible for monitoring the cost of the construction. The railroad will actually do uh, ultimate final designs and, and provide records for us, even though we, it'll be de designed with, within our standards and at our grade and, and direction, but they will actually provide uh, designs for us. The uh, railroad is gonna charge us 8% overhead um, on top of the construction cost, and the, uh, the, the argument, the, the, that's their normal rate of overhead, they say. Uh, they've re excuse me, the normal rate of overhead is 10%, but they've reduced it to 8% uh, because we're doing the oversight of the um, uh, force account work. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is where we're at. Uh, we normally we probably would have brought this to you back consent because we did have a discussion uh, back in August, but because of this, this uh, new uh, amendment, uh, we wanted to get your input. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Director Wright. Uh, questions, comments, uh, Board Member Lowry? They were running freight trains over these tracks before SMART got involved with changing the tracks. <clears throat> when the freight trains ran over these intersections, uh, why wasn't there a problem then? Why didn't we start doing things like casings way back when? Well, actually, you know, casings have been the rule for as long as I can remember, uh, but our facilities and their facilities were predated that. Um, the one problem is when the, the pipes that we have underneath these tracks are quite old. Uh, in two cases, I think I said vitrified clay pipes. They will need to be replaced at some time. Uh, at that time, if we don't put a casing in now, we'll go and dig two huge pits on either side of the railroad, and we'll actually have to uh, force a casing underneath, um, which is probably, in a perfect world, is probably at least twice as expensive. but. For some reason around railroad tracks, we always find heavily contaminated soil, which seems to escalate the price substantially. So in this case, the railroad had, takes full responsibility for all the soil they take out of there. It becomes theirs, uh, and we just get the casing. Thank you. Board Member Carney. So I, I, I understand the, the time and materials component. Can you, can you tell me, um, how much of the 800,000 or whatever number it turns out to be would you expect as a percentage to be materials and how much labor? Let's see. Uh, I can't really tell you exactly. I, I know that uh, the, the casing, the entire bill on Sebastopol Road was $50,000. Um, that's what the time and material. Um, they used a reinforced concrete um, uh, casing uh, down there. Typically, we use steel casings. Uh, they, I, I'm not sure that was the pipe that was available on the day they had to do it, and they were it, it, the train was coming, the tracks were coming down the street, and that's what they used. And it's acceptable. That's allowable in our standards. Uh, since then, we did some research and located steel casings. And uh, to put in the steel casing, uh, it was around uh, twenty-two or twenty-three thousand dollars just to purchase the casing itself. So then if you look at the, um, so the, there's, then there's the digging the trench, there's the backfill, placing the thing. So if you figure 22, 25 is the actual casing, I don't know, another three or four thousand dollars for backfill, then probably another twenty thousand dollars or something for equipment and labor and things like that. And, and that's then, pretty rough. Okay. <laughs> and I can understand being on the job and being able to um, audit, if you will, the materials used, but how do you actually do that with the labor? And this is all under the heading of, this is a brand new thing for us to be doing uh, design builds and how are we gonna be doing design builds in the future in terms of uh, controlling uh, how much it should be? Is there a, 
engineer's estimate before you yeah. go in? Well, actually, this is outside the design build. Typically, I think when you do a design build, the contractor bids one lump sum, and for that price, he'll design it and he'll build it. But in this case, SMART has got that contract, and so we're not really involved with that piece of it. Um, they are offering to give us a bid price uh, to do the work, uh, but uh, the problem is there's risk and all these other issues, uh, and their prices are very high, uh, and that's why we determined it's better uh, to do it on a force account basis. Um, hopefully we won't be wrong, but uh, we believe that's, that's correct. Um, so in terms of uh, doing force account work, uh, there's actual very uh, strict rules on doing that. The, the state of California has a specification, and they call, that's what they call force account, and they have a section, and they have uh, two major books. They have their standard specification that gives you absolute rules on how to do it, and then they have the equipment and materials rental rates. Uh, and that gives you, for every piece of equipment, it gives you the value per hour that you charge for that. It gives you any surcharges on labor. There's all sorts of stuff. So, and they have forms, so you basically count up the people, put them in your chart, you count up the equipment, you put it in your chart, you do the extensions, and it gives you a number that nobody can dispute. So the real item that is disputed, typically, in force account is who was actually there. That's why it's important for the city to have a representative standing on the ground seeing when people come, seeing when people go, what equipment was there, and that sort of thing. That's very helpful, thank you. Uh, do you think the 2% is sufficient to cover the oversight? The 2% of overhead? Oh, uh, no, they're, they're giving us a deduction of 2%. Right. So and, those and people are on our staff. They will be our staff out of our engineering division. Right. Will be and down will there. that deduction be sufficient to, to pay for the, the the labor that we will spend. Well, quite truthfully, uh, that was a negotiated amount. They wanted to charge us 10% uh, overhead, and we said, well, wait, we're doing all this work, mm -hmm. so we agreed on 2%, and, you know, that's, okay. that's the way it went. Okay. And just out of curiosity, how big are the casings, and how much bigger are the casings and the pipes that are running through them? I think the casings are 24 inches, and we put a 12-inch in there, or t a 20-inch maybe in a 12-inch pipe. So uh, what we do is we put a casing in and we uh, put uh, them on a, in a wastewater side. We put them in with skids underneath them. Uh, and then we'll fill the casing full of a, uh, a sand cement slurry. So it'll be more solid in there. So it'll be, it'll be support the tracks. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Dan. Uh, a couple of questions. The uh, concept of force accounting that we're, that's being employed here. Mm -hmm. What is that normally used for? Why does that exist in the lexicon of things that are available? Well, uh, the most common way, well, f in road construction or any kind of underground construction, all sorts of things happen that you didn't anticipate. Uh, and so uh, when you dig a big a hole and you find uh, an old uh, you know, bridge down there and you have to remove it, you, know, you can't stop the contract and get a bid from the contractor to keep going. So typically what we do is we just say, we'll do it on, track the hours and do it on force account. Uh, we actually have our on-call contracts that we do, uh, and um, those are all paid on a force account basis. Those are a little different though because the, um, there's a labor markup, and the contractor actually bids his labor markup, and that's the way we get competitive price on that. Okay, so in, so in this instance, um, essentially, our work is being viewed as, um, what, what, what I'm interpreting that your description as being, if you had a contract that covered, it was a design and build contract that covered a certain statement of work and a certain requirement and something that was beyond the uh, scope of the, require, of the contract came up and you didn't want to delay the project, you would then use this force accounting approach. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, I would it's like just, prevents disruption. Oh, yeah, also, but also we use it a lot in regular, normal bid contracts also. It's a it's very common uh, way of uh, doing work that isn't actually unexpected labor. Okay. And the reason that you use this formulamatic, for, formulamatic approach that's approved by the state and is in whatever mm -hmm. the documentation is that you referred to, the reason for using that is to avoid discussion and uh, kind of the negotiation, the back and forth that's typical 
with change orders uh, well, on contracts? Well, for example, they gave us a lump sum, you know, no problem, no risk price of $90,000 to do Sebastopol Road. <coughs> and we said, well, there's no way you're going to spend $90,000 down there. And so rather than argue over that, we said, just do it force account. And um, so it's uh, a lot of contractors don't like force count. They don't think the markups are enough to make the profit they need, but that's, that's what's been established by the state. That's what's used throughout the state. Okay. And if we look at the one, two, three, four, five, six, including Jenning, mm -hmm. if we look at those six specific um, work, statements of work, if you will, for each mm -hmm. of those six different activities, um, do you have an estimate, engineering estimate from the city city's perspective of what each one of those should cost? You know, uh, we, the only one we really looked at that closely is 8th Street, and I think that one's, uh, it's around $50,000 for the casing. On 8th Street, what we're gonna do is uh, we can, we have enough, our, we're just gonna cut the pipe on their side. We have enough, actually, fire flow that we can do that. And, and blind fans, they'll put, a, they'll put a casing in there. And then they're so they're going to pay charges about, about the same price we think for the uh, casing there, but the wastewater pipe uh, is I think like like ninety thousand dollars. So I think the whole cost for Eighth Street is going to be uh, we're estimating around one hundred thirty thousand okay. dollars. So they're actually giving us proposed estimated costs. Uh, so we'll in an effort because obviously you know they understand that this is a force count contract, and one problem with these is you don't want you can't go over your contract amount. So you have to kind of right. keep track of it as you go along. Okay. What I'm wrestling with is the the range you've given us here to consider, $269,000 to $800,000. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wrestling with what's really appropriate in terms of oversight and control. Um, and I, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable, actually, mm -hmm. with the ambiguity that's associated with approving, for example, an $800,000 contract without having some more understanding of, will that in fact cover all six crossings? Is it likely to only cover two? It, it, uh, I, I would be more comfortable if I had more understanding of what it was we're actually being asked mm -hmm. to authorize. Yeah, and that's why we, we brought this to you, for, to have that discussion. And, and I say we can actually, uh, we have options here, I think. Uh, if, I think we should go forward, well, I recommend we go forward with the first contract that we talked about before, the 269. Uh, but as far as the amendment, um, we can uh, bring that back uh, at a later time. We could do a, a lower cost amendment and come back with with future as we as we get closer down on prices uh, or we have we could do you know whatever the board would like and in terms of timeline for the six activities that are listed here in the staff report um, if you based on the timeline that you anticipate today will all of that work be completed in six months will it be completed in a year and a half what's the right. timeline well, that's a good question. When we brought this to you on August 16th, I thought it was all going to be happening in like three weeks. That's what I was led to believe for the railroad. Um, now, uh, the weather's coming in. I, you know, I, I just, you know, it's, I'm not managing the construction contract, but I do know the railroad is very anxious to put the, the, their facilities in. And once they get going, they do actually lay track very quickly. So it, uh, we anticipate that would be done in the next, you know, before March or something, I, I, I'm, but I'm just speculating. I think you'll find when they start, that three-week period will probably be just about right. And I think the part that Glenn's raising is when. <clears throat> when will the track get here? When will they, you know, yeah. what will the weather do to them, um, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the actual work when they start moving on these tracks, it's just amazing. Yeah. They say they can do 400 feet a day, that's what the railroad has told us. Uh, and so, of course, in, and, and through a lot of the city of Santa Rosa, it, the track is double tracked, which is something I didn't realize before, about a month ago, so. And, and they are currently putting those crossings in. I went over one just uh, yesterday uh, on one of the streets that's we're not impacted by, but it's happening. Uh, and I certainly encourage, because of the risk 
Um, not getting these crossings in, uh, I, I certainly can state and I, I concur with Deputy Director Wright's comment that the force account method and the, uh, the, the cost numbers are a standard of the industry state set by the State of California uh, Department of Transportation. And so it, it's common throughout the state. And I, I think that it, if this board wishes to watch uh, and, and is concerned about the cost, that we should authorize this full amendment uh, with check-ins as, as to what uh, the crossings as they occur have cost us so that they don't have to, we don't have to form a, a special meeting to deal with this uh, and we don't risk not getting the crossing in uh, our facilities in before the crossing is ready to be installed. So I, I think that there's enough safeguards in this uh, using standard cost procedures and our oversight of it from our own utility people that our ratepayers are being protected in the process. That's my opinion. Anybody else? I'll, I'll go ahead and um, I'll move a resolution of the board. And um, I, I guess um, I think that incorporating Chairman Dowd's comments and what, what I'm hearing him say, and I concur, is that we're asking for reports back as the crossings go in to get calibrated on the price. Um, yeah, I'd, li I'd like to ask for specificity there on how frequently the checkbacks would be. Um, I think I would be comfortable moving forward if we had a checkback, if you will, every time that there is a crossing completed so we could see what the actual costs were and have the ability to make adjustments at those times. Okay. I, don't, I don't see that that's uh, inappropriate and you could add that to the resolution if uh, you so choose, Board members. Okay. So um, that, that may have to be done by, if, if I might, I have one further question and just perhaps others understand I don't. Is it your um, um, estimate that 800,000 will take care of all the crossings? That's what we're thinking right now. Again, um, like I pointed out that uh, crossing at Jennings after we started potholing it and looking at it, it got very complicated. Uh, but we still believe right now it's eight hundred thousand dollars. And uh, as new information uh, comes forward, I can I can report that to the board. I can report that either in a written memo or I'm certainly here a lot. I can give a verbal uh, update also on that. Let me second the motion motion so we can have discussion. I, if I think she's the, the resolution okay. of state that as each as each crossing is uh, completed, that you will send out an email blast to the board saying, unless it comes at a time when we have a board member, a BPU meeting scheduled, you can do it by just information basis. So the way I see that is once a, a project's completed and the but, and, and all, the, all the extensions of the force count work is done and I know what it cost, we would distribute that to the board. I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so one, with one that, more. I'll move the resolution. Oh, I'm one, sorry. one more. Oh. Are these going to be, any of these going to be simultaneous, or are they, in fact, one at a time? Actually, they might be pretty quick, because if they're doing 400 feet of, a day, I mean, the distance between 8th Street and 7th Street isn't very far, so they might be working on them simultaneously. Okay. Uh, my only concern is if 800,000 was light, and they're doing them all right up, we, we don't want to have to come back in emergency session to, okay, a, a little bit of money just to make sure this is done. So that, that's, that's my understanding my of the $800,000 was that it was more than enough for the well, initial estimate, though. Yeah, so. that, that's my question. Yeah, it's, is that there's, true? there's no guarantees on that, but that's uh, what we're thinking is a sufficient amount of money. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and actually my original concern my original concern actually is this is the, this will be the first time we've used this particular approach with this specific situation. And as you're indicating, uh, we don't know what will be found. We don't know what additional costs may be, may be incurred. Um, when I look at, well, the map's down now. 
when I, when I look at the map that was originally there, it appeared that there are several crossings that likely would be done maybe one at a time. And then as you move to the north, because I believe they're going south to north, and as you move to the north, there are more crossings that would probably be done simultaneously. What I was hoping for, and the reason why I support the language that's being added to the resolution, is that uh, seemed to be a means of getting a higher level of comfort that $800,000 would in fact be sufficient. Um, do you, as you, and that was also kind of what I was getting at with the timeline, how quickly will we actually know whether these estimates are reasonable? Is it your belief, is, based on what you know today about the projects, is it your belief that uh, there will be sufficient time to make adjustments that may be necessary if reality is different from the engineering estimates? But I think you have to look at this resolution as it is before you, and it says not to exceed amount of 800,000. So uh, it, nothing can be okayed if, it, if this project exceeds 800,000 without a revisit to the board. Right, I understand that. Um, however, if we approve, well, because this is actually a new area, and because there are unknowns about what the condition is that will be encountered, you could encounter situations where $800,000 is twice what you're actually going to incur. I'm actually less concerned about that situation. Um, and so I'm, I'm, as long as um, staff is comfortable that they would have the ability to continue work within the kind of constraints that we're talking about, and also protect us from the risk of being in a situation where it's not $800,000, it's a million two, mm -hmm. and it has to be approved next week mm -hmm. because of the time phase, phasing that's occurring on the design work project with the railroad. I'm actually concerned about both of those issues, but I'm more concerned about the issue of actually addressing an overrun above and beyond the $800,000. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting, if this particular amendment that's being discussed now will allow you to have sufficient time to actually know what the costs are and to know whether or not your initial estimates are accurate, I'm comfortable with it. That's really what I'm trying to ascertain well, from your perspective. Yeah. Well, actually, I personally haven't been in discussion with the railroad, but based on staff people that are, that are, this is what they're recommending. So that's, I mean, that's all I can tell you from my personal point of view right now. Uh, I personally, we need a not to exceed number, and I actually don't like having large and not to exceed numbers because uh, other people see that number that are doing the work, so. Right, uh, so, so let me kind of bring it back. If we were to approve this amendment with an $800,000 uh, cap and with you reporting back each time that there is a uh, completion on which you could say what the costs will actually be, what I am hearing, I believe, is that that would allow us to move forward with some certainty as we get new information each time that the crossing is complete. If, if we believe there's a problem, we will immediately uh, get something on the agenda and get it to the board. And I think two weeks is, you know, typically we meet every two weeks, it's gonna be difficult this Christmas time, but okay. I think we'll have enough time to get something in front of the board. What, what I'm see. really hoping to avoid is that special meeting where yeah. we have to be here in three days and there's really very little time for, yeah. um, for us to actually do information gathering before the meeting mm -hmm. takes place. Yeah. One of the six is already done, right? So that's what? Yeah, and that was just 50,000, so, 50, yeah. yeah. So you have five more to go. Yeah, we got five more to go. So yeah. 750,000. Yeah, and, and, and one of them is just a casing <laughs> with no pipe, and so that's probably gonna be 50,000. So, I mean, 8th Street is a difficult one, uh, and Jennings is gonna be difficult, uh, but uh, so a couple of the other ones aren't that difficult. So we got, it's a mix. And actually, you know, uh, in the utility business, we're used to digging where we don't know what's underneath there. That happens every day of our life. Believe me, you never know where you're going when you dig underground. Board Member Carmen. Is there a reason we, we have, I mean, we're gonna do this, and, and we're gonna do it under this. It's not like they're gonna come to us in the, at, at the end and we can say, well, we don't wanna do the last under. 
So do we need a number? Do we have to have a not to exceed number? We can't just say we we're doing I think as, as Deputy Director Wright indicated, he would feel more comfortable yeah. if we have a not to exceed. And I think Director Ferris would as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it strikes me that the, you know, we're talking about a risk here of, of um, exceeding the 800K. And the risk is that um, we will, be, will we be able to react quickly enough to get money to complete a crossing, which we all see as, as quite necessary. And I, it seems like um, Deputy Director Wright has, you know, researched as much as he could to figure out what a number is. It's much higher than if he just multiplied 50 by seven. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think we kind of have to, we have to trust that and then we have to be willing. We know there's a risk and we may have to react. So. Um, I think that's the best we can do. Do, do you see any other? Yeah. No. If I might give you yes. some comfort, the city manager can authorize an additional 100,000 if she, uh, you know, if we have a, a small gap. It, we'll know for sure, I, I guarantee you, if there's a $200,000 problem, if they, you know, dig into, as Deputy Wright has mentioned, uh, a, a bridge. Uh, one of the worst ones I remember was a 10,000 gallon buried fuel tank uh, on West College when we were doing water and sewer replacement right in the middle of the intersection which and a lot of concrete. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you can, I mean, as Glenn said, you can, every day you dig, it's a genuine surprise uh, what you can run into. But I think with that caveat, you're, you're real safe. Okay. And then it would come back to the board for approval. Okay. With that, I'll. Are uh, you I am. Okay. Yes. I'll move a resolution of the Board of Public Utilities approving a reimbursement agreement with Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit District for design and construction of water and sewer improvements at various railroad crossings, city product project identification number 1747, and authorizing the director of utilities to amend the agreement to, in to increase the not to exceed amount. Um, I think and it's stated as 800K here in the resolution. Also, um, with the additional request from the BPU of uh, reporting back of the costs via email to the Board of Public Utilities as each crossing is completed and as significant new information comes forward. Second. And the amount is shown in the text. Yes, the amount is shown in the text as 800K. Second. Second. A motion made by board member Swint and seconded by board member Carney. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And it's a, it's a good discussion and I think uh, it's clear that the board wants to give you uh, latitude to get this thing done in a timely manner, Deputy Director Wright. Uh, but we obviously still have our fiduciary responsibility to our ratepayers. So carry on. I think you got the next one. I got the next item. And once again, I have to apologize. I'm going to make you turn around again. Uh, I don't know, in the future, maybe we'll have to learn how to turn the TV sets on. Um, anyway, well, good afternoon again, Dep um, <coughs> to Chairman Dowd and members of the board. Uh, actually, the data I'm telling you right now is at 9 o'clock this morning, and based on the rain we had at our, the MSC South, it's probably 5% more than it is shown in these diagrams. Uh, so the next time I'm in front of you, we should have uh, some, some interesting results. Uh, there's a, I plotted this this morning off the Department of Water Resources uh, uh, website. You can see the little blip that we had and our little five inches of rain that we had just before Thanksgiving there. So as of today, uh, Lake Sonoma has 203,918 acre feet in it. That's actually nine o'clock this morning. That's 83% of the water supply pool or 53.5 of the total. Uh, they're releasing um, 132 cubic feet per second and it's receiving almost 1,000 cubic feet this, uh, per second at nine o'clock this morning. Uh, so that's... Um, yeah. 
These are 100-day plots, incidentally. Um, and the first thing you'll notice on this thing, there's a little wiggle up there, and I can't figure out what that is. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But um, uh, Lake Mendocino, uh, again, the, uh, uh, the five inches uh, didn't do as much up there in Ukiah. Uh, and that's probably because the, uh, they only have a 100-acre uh, watershed, actually, to Lake Mendocino. And not much water is coming through the tunnel right now. Uh, so Lake Mendocino has 54,639 acre feet. That's 78% of the water supply and 45% full. Uh, so from a flood control point, we're in good shape. Uh, in is 200 and out is 153. So I tried to uh, figure out what that little wiggle was. I think it's just a computer glitch. But mm -hmm. so what I did was got a plot of the um, uh, Potter Valley uh, flows thinking that might be, maybe they released a big slug of water in the pot of valley. Yeah. So there's, right below there uh, are the releases uh, from uh, Lake Pillsbury uh, to Van Arsdale into Potter Valley and then into Lake Mendocino. Yeah. And uh, it looks like the little wiggle there is kind of when they drop the flows, but it's, it's hard to say. But as you can see right now, they're not releasing very much uh, through, through at uh, Van Arsdale. Lake Pillsbury. Again, same trend. You can see the five inches of rain there. Uh, Lake Pillsbury is at 23,348. That's 27%. <laughs> Uh, and they're uh, releasing 285 uh, cubic feet per second. Uh, then you, when you get down to Van Arsdale, uh, 240 cubic feet is going down the eel and 50 is going to Potter Valley. At Lake, Hus at Lake Hus um, excuse me, at uh, Hacienda Bridge, uh, a lot more dramatic in the river when you see five inches of rain. Uh, but at 9 o'clock this morning, um, Hacienda had uh, only 425 cubic feet per second. And I wouldn't, with that much rain, we might be up to, I don't know, 1,000 by now. Who knows? It's hard to, hard to say. Um, probably you read in the newspaper that uh, we had 6,400 Chinook uh, go up the river. So that's an all-time record. So this is a record of bumper year, just so you can see. So the, the last time, it looks like it was uh, 2003 that we even got close to that. Um, and I, I spoke to their biologist this morning. The rubber dam is down now, of course, waiting for the, um, you know, the, for the higher flows. It, it was removed a week ago. And so uh, once the dam is down, the fish just go up the river. They don't need to go up the fish ladder. So uh, counting is done. So he says this can be... They're still, they're reevaluating the videos and there's gonna be a few more fish, but it's gonna be greater than 6,400, but less than 6,500. Um, on Monday, um, December 3rd, um, we have a TAC meeting at nine o'clock. And then on uh, Thursday, I guess that's the sixth, uh, there's an RRWA meeting in Windsor at nine o'clock. And that concludes my report. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned that <clears throat> Lake Sonoma was 83% of the water supply. Mendocino was 78% of the water supply. But Pillsbury is only 27? Yeah. Um, well, how so, come it's so low? OK, f you got to remember that uh, it's not a water supply lake. It's a power lake. And it's, it, it also has a component to it that neither, that Sonoma definitely doesn't have and Mendocino really doesn't have, except for what water comes for the eel, is that it uh, impounds water uh, in snow. There's actually a large snowfall behind Lake Pillsbury. There's actually a mountain there called Snow Mountain. And so they leave that lake very low until later on in the season when the snow melts and then it fills up. So also, uh, PG&E uh, likes to drain that water out of there so that they can produce power and make money. So an empty lake means more money for the power company. Thank you.
That completes that item. We have public comments on non-agenda items, but it looks like we can skip right on through that. Uh, we have no referrals, no written communications, any subcommittee reports? The, uh, the budget subcommittee met on Monday of this week and is planning an additional meeting during the month of December. I had one report. Um, as you know, um, Board Member Carney and I are working on biosolids with David Gouin and his staff, and we um, met with some of the engineers that are working on that project a couple of weeks ago. We had a fascinating two, I think it was about two hour meeting, and uh, one of the things that they said that I think that really surprised me and probably surprised you was that 25% of the biosolid mass that we deal with is coming from garbage disposals. And I had no idea that it was that high. And uh, a number of people compost their garbage, their kitchen waste, but we don't for a number of reasons. But it would be interesting to see if there are some other ways to encourage people to do that, or at least to help me find solutions to the problems I find when I do try to compost it. But um, I, th I thought it was really interesting. Others? Board member reports? None? Director's report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a few items. Uh, you already uh, took up a lot of time with this <laughs> meeting. You know, so this idea that you were going to retire or something, I don't. Yeah. Uh, the LTP uh, facility access road paving project is complete. We're raising the iron. Uh, the staff thanks you for the rapid approval. So we have a wet weather working condition that is really good compared to where we were. At the uh, wastewater treatment plant, uh, we're working on making the south driveway the main entrance to the plant. Uh, I was out there yesterday and they were doing the conform paving to the uh, street. So we're very close on that. Um, Range Avenue, and this is one of those projects that, um, you, you know, part of our water supply mission is fire protection. And sometimes we all forget that, that uh, that is one of the major things that we do provide our ratepayers. And uh, Range Avenue is not a replacement project, it's not, it's a, a fire project. We raise the size to 12 so that we can meet the fire flow requirements of a large number of apartment houses that, that occupy that area. Uh, you know, it, if you, you could avoid doing those things as long as you never have a fire, um, all is well. But when you do have a fire and you can't put it out, um, you know, we need to we need to shoot somebody and, um, you know, to make it better. Uh, and to us, it's better that we have a model. We model these things and we get them fixed as we have the time and crew or the engineering time to do it and the job is now tied in. Montgomery Village is a project that is coming at North Point, uh, Midway, McGowan, um, Hannon, Sonoma. They're gonna be, uh, I think the most important part of this is there's meetings with the Montgomery Village representatives on November 5th to discuss project coordination and how they're going about it. Uh, one of the options there's options and we, we want to make sure that we have them. One is, is you just close it down the street and you just go all out and finish it. Get it paid, get it done, get it back in service. And you can do that in a matter of a few days. And you can work long and hard and add hours, do whatever. Uh, otherwise you can do it little bites at a time. Uh, you know, just about what a day's production is. And you, you know, every day a section is closed and and finally it's paved. There's different ways of doing it. We, you know, we're meeting with the operators out there to try and determine what works best for them in their business. Um, we got some very interesting uh, compliments on our work. Um, uh, actually, this is on Colorado uh, Boulevard and we had a customer call to come in to crew. She said that uh, they had all been very nice and considerate with all her needs and her questions which is when you get somebody to do that, you realize you're, it's not our crews, this is a contractor. Uh, and we've done the right thing and 
uh, and that's very pleasing. Nordyke, we in Oliver, Victor Lane area, water customer called uh, uh, to compliment our engineering technician on her responsive and pers personable work resolving problems the customer was having with the project. And I think, you know, you heard today, you know, when we talked about how our, you know, internally how we worry about coordinating and, and working well inside and how we push so hard on customer service. And I think this is an example of another department, it's uh, Colleen Ferguson's operation, uh, you know, pushing that same issue that we try to make sure we satisfy our customers and meet their needs. And uh, that mean, it doesn't mean you blow them off and walk on down the road and forget it. It means you take care of their issues and, and resolve them. And uh, those are the, some of the things that came out of it. Finally, this is my last VPU meeting. Uh, I won't be here for the December 6th, or 6th, if there is one. Um, we'll be at um, Aqua. Uh, and and uh, truly, from the bottom of my heart, I thank the board, uh, and I thank the previous board uh, for uh, such constructive work on what I think is the people's business. and. Um, I kind of tell myself every day that uh, why do I work here? And it's not self-aggrandizement, uh, it's not any of that, because that's meaningless. It, we work here for the betterment of our community and our citizens. And, uh, and it's so much helpful to have such a board that is willing to dig into issues, uh, constructive decision, uh, discussions, constructive work. And I think in the long run, our ratepayers are well served. And uh, I know for a fact the city council has supported our efforts. Um, one of the people I, I must say stood out in my mind when I was thinking about all this is Mr. Dow. And for the years he put up with all the hearings on the Geysers project and the beatings he took. And, and they, some of them were really nasty. Um, and to be able to say thank you for your comments next was really difficult when you're under personal attack. But for the good of the order, he did it. And uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that we've seen in this board and I've seen in the city council was the willingness to put the community as a whole first and personal issues second. And it's made this job, made my job so much easier and so much uh, more productive and I think we've We've had a good, good time. Uh, we can look back at some of the fun things that happened and at the time not so funny. Uh, but uh, I think that the uh, goal of looking ahead and trying to try to visionize where we're going and how we can best serve and reduce the costs of our projects to our ratepayers and provide great service to them down the road is one of those things that is hard to do. As I always tell people, you can, it sounds, a lot of things sound good when you say them fast. It's when you go to carry out the work that it gets really tough and you run into the real problems. And uh, Dick, I got to say that your, your efforts in supporting the staff, and I know how hard it was. And what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, Dick is a certified expert in construction, uh, court certified as an expert witness. He showed up on our Geysers project on numerous occasions to help us uh, and, and frankly the contractors with, you know, devising solutions to problems and, uh, you know, giving us our, uh, an idea of what is right and what is wrong. And he did it for free. Not many places would you ever see that kind of thing happen. So uh, that's why I'm lucky and that's why I've loved uh, being here. We've had a series of experts in all kinds of areas that have given their all and uh, made this job really fun. And I think hopefully, as we look back, is it the real, as they always say about war generals and politicians and what have you, uh, history always will tell you what was done right and what was done wrong. At the time, there's always all kinds of battles and yelling, but 
history always tells you, and the Geysers Project, I think, is history and tells you why and, and how hard we all worked uh, all along the way, the board, the city council, and us. And, and frankly, uh, part of it is our ratepayers have been willing to support us. And, um, you know, between the two, wow, this has been actually a great job and the most marvelous staff you could ever ask for. Uh, and people that are willing to work together. I don't, I don't sit and, and to break up fights and uh, things like that among staff. It just doesn't happen. And uh, you know, I don't have to yell or holler or do anything. It just, they work so well together. It's such a team. But it's also, it all comes from the board, whether you believe it or not. And it all comes from the city council, whether you believe it or not. People pay attention. They watch what you do and they emulate it. The board, it's deliberate, respectful, their employees are deliberate and respectful. Uh, and uh, that's something I've learned over the years. I've worked for boards that uh, you couldn't, but you can't even imagine how difficult it was. And you'd go home every night, just tear your hair out. And uh, when I came here, people have served because they love their community. We have different ideas, we have different thoughts, different concerns, different approaches. But the one thing I've seen in common in all of Santa Rosa has been we want to make our community better. We want to make it a great place to live. We want to make it sustainable. We want to have effective and cost controls. We want our kids to have, we're not selling their future for our now. And when I see the, the, the work that's been done in this area, this is a wonderful uh, job to have and a wonderful place to be. With that, I thank you so very much for your for your notes and your thoughts. And uh, I, you know, as I've told the boss, I stand available, certainly, if there's information needed, if there's somebody to bounce problems off of, uh, I'll be one that's certainly here to, to do that. Uh, with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry for the long word. I think, I think from all of us, Miles, thank you. Thank you again for all that you've done for this community and the sub-regional system. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of this meeting. And since I took your Wednesday away this week, Board Secretary Perez says there's nothing for the December 6th meeting and the cancellation meeting notice will be going out. So enjoy uh, your afternoon off uh, next Thursday. Okay? <laughs> Thanks. And, and good evening. Have a good night. Good to see you. Oh, you do.